Sculpture Center with Lee Arnold to talk about the exhibition Groundswell, Women of Land Art. Lee, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. What motivated you to put this exhibition together now, and what um, did you, uh, how did you organize the works and select the ones that you were able to include in the exhibition? Well, this exhibition idea really came to me um, over seven years ago when I proposed it to my colleagues here at the Nasher. At the time, I was just fresh off working on the artist Robert Smithson. I wrote a dissertation on his work. Um, and it was really through that work that I got to meet and know the artist Nancy Holt. And at the time, you know, she had stopped making art and was focusing almost exclusively on supporting the legacy of Robert Smithson. And so, even though we had many conversations, I was never able to get her to talk about her own work. It was always, let's stick to the task at hand, which was the work of Robert Smithson. But I, of course, became very curious. I knew of Sun Tunnels because that is one of the few works by women artists that's brought into histories of land art. But there's so much more to her body of work that is so much more complex and interesting beyond Sun Tunnels, which is in and of itself an extraordinarily complex work. But it's also not the only thing she did. And so I became deeply fascinated with wanting to know more about her work and her career. And sadly, she died in 2014 before I could really get beyond our conversations of Smithson. And I began to wonder if an artist like Nancy Holt, who had this seminal earthwork, was still so little known. Who else out there was making work alongside Nancy, alongside Robert Smithson, Heiser, De Maria, that I didn't know about? and why not? And that just started this question, this big question of who, who else is out there? And also wanting to understand a fuller picture of land art beyond this kind of very macho gesture of mark making in the desert, which is kind of how we're all taught what land art is. But land art can be so many more things. And I think it's through the work of these women artists that you start to understand a fuller picture of that. So you brought together the work of 12 women artists. Mm -hmm. How did you group them and organize the exhibition? It's organized thematically and not really chronologically within those themes, although it's interesting as you're in one theme of the show, you'll start to notice that the work is almost on top of each other because the artists are looking at similar things, responding to similar things, like um, the first pictures of the earth taken from space mm -hmm. was this moment where everyone in the world got to see the earth in its fragile totality and as an object. And so you start to see work by all the artists that are responding to these ideas, like there's something in the water, right? And uh, so there, it's organized thematically uh, among themes that I felt really um, resonated among across all of these artists' works um, and could help us understand land art in different ways. So there's kind of the more traditional themes like mapping, cartography, the grid, mm -hmm. travel. These things are themes that have been explored in lots of histories of land art. Then you go a little bit further and a little bit further out in the atmosphere, and you think about all of the work that is related to celestial bodies, celestial movements, the sun rises, the sun sets, the equinoxes, which tomorrow is the autumnal equinox, our opening day, mm -hmm. um, solstices, and so many of the artists, not just Nancy Holt with sun tunnels, but Michelle Stewart, Lita Albuquerque, countless others were thinking about our connection to the cosmos and how to kind of establish these greater bonds between ourselves and the universe. And then other themes that are, I think, less common in histories of land art, which is the subject of taking land art into the public sphere mm -hmm. and kind of the legacy of land art that is seen in public art. I don't think we would have as robust a public art program across the country without land art, because land art allowed artists to think beyond the bounds of their, their studios, beyond the bounds of the gallery, and to making something that felt real, you know, something that was a part of something else, that had a context that they could respond to. And those are the very basics of public art. Mary Miss, we're standing in front of a work the Nasher uh, 
commissioned for this show, Stream Trace, Dallas Branch Crossing. Yes. Did you want to tell us a little bit more about yes. what inspired the work? So I wanted to be able to bring this stream above ground in this section of the garden and to reveal it from its source to its outfall into the Trinity River beyond the walls of the garden. Oh, so there are pieces of the sculpture outside of this well, space. Well, I've made a line that you can tr follow to trace where this stream used to run. Of course, you can't follow it exactly because there are buildings and highways, but in certain places, you actually cross the, you know, the real stream. But here, it gets to come above ground. And I wanted this to be like the reflection that you see on water. Yeah. You know, this kind of uh, mirroring that you see uh, with water in, in a stream. And I wanted to suggest to the viewers that it continues beyond the walls of the garden. So I put a mirror at each end that reflects the pieces in between to seem as though it's continuing oh, lovely. Uh, further. What's, what are some of the stories that this sculpture reflects about the life of that stream? Well, I'm just uh, starting the story. And over the next three months, while the exhibition is up, I've asked six artists in Dallas who know the city better than I do to lead walks either to the source or to the outfalls and to tell about the history of this city or you know, the communities that used to live here, whether it's the Freedman's Town or Little Jerusalem or somebody might be talking about what used to grow here or the kind of insects or the Native Americans who lived here. So I would like this history of the stream to be revealed while at the same time thinking about the future. One thing that's interesting about water systems like this is we build a city, but the stream doesn't disappear. Here it's in a sewer pipe, and if you go outside the walls, you'll see manholes on either side. So, you know, those are access points to the sewer system. But this is, uh, this is the place that you get to realize that it's even here. So when I look back here, I see not just the reflections, but also the pattern of the X's. What, what was uh, behind those? Well, I, I knew that I wanted to use a mirrored uh, surface. And I was looking at some patterns that water can make in sand, and they were these cross uh, marks. Patches, excellent. And also, I, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek, I called the piece uh, Dallas Branch Crossing, and these are, you know, crosses, and so I was, everything kind of came together to say that this was the, the form. Anything else would be too solid, a circle or a, you know, square or dot, uh, so I decided on this form. Love it. Patricia Johansson, welcome to Art This Week. Thank you. Your Fair Park Lagoon is an iconic piece of art for us who live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of planning it and thinking through how it would interact with its landscape? How it interacts with the landscape? Well, first of all, there was no landscape before I got here. There was a kind of stagnant flood basin um, that, that people really didn't like, which is why Harry Parker invited me to come look at it. And what he said to me was really pretty interesting. He said, can you do anything with our old mud hole? And, you know, and two boys had drowned in it the day before I got there because there was so much debris in the bottom. Uh, they had gotten stuck in the mud and the older boy ran out to get the younger, his, his brother, and they both drowned. And so that was my introduction to Fair Park Lagoon. And I said to him, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, do anything you want to do this is Dallas. If they like it, they'll pay for it. And, you know, nobody has ever said that to me before or since. And so basically what I wanted to do was not, there was a Mark de Suvero sculpture mm -hmm. um, standing out in front of the museum. And I, that was exactly what I didn't want to do, a, piece, a big monumental freestanding sculpture. I did want plants 
and animals. I wanted to recreate the ecosystem. I wanted to clean up the water, uh, which was murky and filled with algae. And, and I wanted people to be able to experience microhabitats. And in order to do that, I needed to bring them out over the water. And so I did what Harry told me. He said, design what you want. I did. And he looked at it. He said, that's great. And he gave me a show at the Dallas Museum of Art. And he exhibited the drawings. And they did a beautiful poster. And, um, and then he had a reception. And it was filled with wealthy people who could donate money to build this. And I was, I was standing there talking to somebody else, and this beautiful woman came over to me in a full-length mink coat uh, with her hands encrusted in diamonds, and she took my hand and said, can you explain this to me? And I went over and I sh she said, where's the water? And I, I understand it was a line drawing, and unless you're trained, you can't, you can't read a line drawing. It's just, you know, it's just shapes. And so I said, well, this is the lagoon, and the, the sculpture's here, and that sculpture's there, and you'll be able to walk out on all the paths, and between the paths, you'll have microhabitats, and there'll be you know, fish and fairy shrimp and things like that in the water. And she looked at me, and she said, I love it. Honey, we're going to get it built. <laughs> Wonderful. And it turned out that she was Sally Lancaster, of the Meadows Foundation, and she was the grants administrator. And so she was another champion of the project because they gave a million dollars every year to build the project. And then the other funder, major funder, was the Communities Foundation of Texas, Ed Feuerbach. So, I mean, every project, particularly big ones, need champions, and I, I was very lucky. I had Harry Parker, I had Sally Lancaster and I had Ed Fjordbach. And you couldn't get three, you know, more well-placed people than that who were, who understood the place, the dialogue, the money issues, the construction issues. You know, they were very experienced. And so miraculously enough, this project that nobody, nobody would have built this except Dallas. I, you know, even today it amazes me that they had the courage to build it because it wasn't like anything that was done at the time. And it, you know, what was it? That's what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. these, were the, these are the most descriptive drawings that they had, mm -hmm. and they had models. Mm -hmm. But you know, most people can't tell much from that. Right. And uh, So to be able to translate your vision to their vision to the reality was quite an accomplishment. Well, to be able to translate the idea that they could actually go out on the sculpture. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what they wouldn't understand until it was built, that suddenly they're out on paths over water. Mm -hmm. And people were just so delighted about that. Uh, I remember at the dedication, a lot of uh, donors and uh, museum patrons and so on came. And they were falling into, they were drinking <laughs> and falling into the water. <laughs> and they were so good natured about it. They'd haul themselves out dripping wet and look, <laughs> Where are my glasses, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and they'd get back up on the sculpture and they'd say, we love it, <laughs> you know? And, oh, and let me actually make one more point. I am very safety conscious. My projects all look like they'd kill you, mm -hmm. but they won't because I'm, I'm knocking on wood. There, it, there isn't any. But um, basically, if you look at where those paths are, there's like a little continental shelf under them. Mm -hmm. The lagoon itself, I think, is uh, 18 feet deep. Mm -hmm. But you don't want people falling into 18 feet of water because right. a lot of people can't swim. And so under every one of those paths is a continental shelf. And it's two and a half feet deep. And the, you see, the plants grow up, so you can't, you can't see that mm -hmm. you're being protected. Mm -hmm. But if you fall in the water, you, will step, you can step right out. Right. Uh, that's you're not going to go into the deep part. You're just going to go on to the little, little shelf. A much more subtle engineering, um, safety engineering technique than putting up a bunch of railings. <laughs> oh, well, they want the, actually the, the city of Dallas, after they got all the money and they started to build it, it was actually being constructed. Uh, they de the city council decided that it should have handrails. And 
I, I just said to everybody, well, you know, if you do that, you're not going to have any sculpture. Right. Uh, and so a few more champions went back to the city council and they got rid of the handrails. Good. And I said, look, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. It's going to be safe. Mm -hmm. And I design for people and animals. I try to create a lot of habitat. And I'm, if I say so myself, I'm pretty good at it. The animals come. Mm -hmm. You can't put them there. Mm -hmm. If you put them there and they don't like it, they'll fly away, they'll paddle away, they'll walk away. Um, and so basically what you do is you put in the food, and you, you do your research, you put in the food and habitat. And then if you're lucky, and I've always been lucky, they come, they migrate in. The, uh, I haven't been back to Fair Park very often, but I did go back at one point and there was a man there uh, lying on one of the paths. And he looked up at me and he said, oh, he said, I'm just collecting turtles to show my children. And he pulled out this big snapping turtle and threw it up on the path <laughs> and his kids ran over. And I said, wow. He said, yeah, he said, I know where every turtle in this place lives. And I said, how many turtles are there? He said, oh, more than 60. And they knew them all, they had named them all. They came every weekend. Um, he was a divorced father, and this is what he and the two kids did on the weekend when he visited. They what went to Fair Park, yeah. and he taught them about fish and turtles. Um, many people don't even see the, uh, the fish, but they're there, and they're down there sweeping away the gravel to create their little nests, and you know, the males are swimming around and guarding the eggs. You know, if you, if you become a naturalist, which is, of course, what I hoped would happen, is you just put it all out there and people discover it. Lena Albuquerque, welcome to Art This Week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. You created Najma Returns specifically for this exhibition. Yes. How does it reflect your investigations into archaeoastronomy and cosmic structures? A, a lot in that uh, in 2003, I came up with a character, a fictive character of a 25th century female astronaut who comes to the planet to remind us of our cosmic connections, to remind us of our connection to the stars. And this is the sixth iteration of the character. And actually more, because I've also done two films. And there's a third part to the film, and it's going to be called Everything is Light. So it's all about exactly that. Archaeoastronomy, she comes from the future, she comes from another planet, but she's here to connect us. I grew up in North Africa, in Tunisia, and I lived in this village, very famous village, called Sidi Bou Said, where it's all white and blue. All the windows, all the doors are blue, and it just imprinted on me. But also the reason I started using it as an artist is that connection between the, the earth and the sky, and the earth and the cosmos. And it looks so incredible next to that color of earth. Where did that Deco it's, uh, it's come It's decomposed from? granite. Is it? Yeah, and there's many shades of that, mm -hmm. but I, I love that one because of, it's very reddish, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I love the contrast. And also echoes uh, work that you did earlier in your career. Yes. Malibu line. Yes, very much so. So at that time, that Malibu line was a trench on a cliff overlooking the ocean, and it was filled, I filled it with blue powdered pigment, same color, that perceptually uh, went all the way out to the horizon and formed a cross. So it was just this beautiful idea of, of a, a, a mark that connected you to outside the earth a little bit, right? And now with, with Najma Returns, Guardian of the Earth, I have her wear 33 solar discs for the 33 vertebras in our, in our skeleton. So it's the idea of igniting light at the beginning of and coming up for that. So she's really a conductor mm -hmm. of light from, from the earth to, to the heavens. And this work here is, is uh, site specific in? In the Mojave Desert. Mojave Desert. And that's okay. from 1980. Okay. And it's called Spine of the Earth. So there is the same reference mm -hmm. of a spine. And the reason I did it, I was really interested in the rituals of the Australian ab ab Aborigines who would do similar geometries and would literally sit with their spine right at the middle of this uh, cross. Uh -huh. So essentially it's a cross, a spiral, there's a circle, a square, and a diamond if you see the entire photograph. But the idea was, uh, again, is getting that energy from the earth mm -hmm. through, through the earth mm -hmm. and, and out. And, and it's beautiful uh, structure that exists in all 
in all growth patterns, the, the spiral. Mm -hmm. And this is pigment, so it was scattered across the right. ground, and, and so you intended for it to be a return to yes. uh, its original yeah. yes. state. Yeah. Yeah. From, the se from 78 to about 84, I mainly did ephemeral works, mm -hmm. and I was really interested in that, the idea, the dust to dust, mm -hmm. you know, the idea that it's, it's, all, it's all this impermanence, but but the geometry and the color that I use are very impactful, mm -hmm. and so they, they stay, the trace remains in your mind mm -hmm. by that kind of color, mm -hmm. which is what I, I've also done with Najma Returns, mm -hmm. is that you can't help but, it's almost like an imprint mm -hmm. because of the intensity of the yeah. opaque you Close color. your eyes and yeah. you get the... And you still have yeah. it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Find all of our videos and sign up for our newsletter at artthisweek.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter.